Hi guys, David here from Almost Daily Science. So today we're going to talk about some new research on a controversial anti-global warming method known as stratospheric aerosol injection. And this new research is going to use modeling and simulation to basically point out that we don't actually understand this method as well as we would like to. Before we talk about these new results, let's just review what stratospheric aerosol injection is. So according to Wikipedia, this is a proposed method of solar geoengineering or solar radiation modification to reduce human-induced global warming. So the idea is you introduce aerosols into the stratosphere, and an aerosol is basically, according to Wikipedia's definition, just a suspension of fine solid particles or liquid droplets in air or another gas. And the idea is that these aerosols being released into the stratosphere will create a cooling effect via global dimming. And we can see that here in this image, we have a, um, we see there's a volcano. This is, this, this method is kind of in, inspired by how volcanoes actually cause global dimming. Uh, but in this scenario, we have a balloon, a weather balloon that's up in the stratosphere and it has a gas canister of some kind it's releasing some compounds which are creating a layer of aerosols or it kind of looks like a cloud in this picture and then the sun is some, some of the sunlight is actually bouncing off and going back into space so that's albedo or, or a cooling effect um, via interference with the sun's rays and then less solar energy makes it to the surface where it's able to cause warming of course, greenhouse gas effect is basically where the sunlight that gets in, when it tries to come back, it's prevented from doing so. Right, and you can see this kind of in the opposite diagram. This is the greenhouse gas effect, which we all know very well by now, but the idea is that the, sol the solar energy which makes it to Earth is, thanks to the greenhouse gases, is unable to escape back into space, and it just stays around and warms the planet. As I mentioned before, this method of global dimming or a method for global cooling is actually inspired by volcanoes. And so when a volcano erupts, it releases a lot of ash and sulfur dioxide. And some of those particles make it up into the stratosphere where they actually end up being fairly persistent. They'll stick around for a long time. And then that uh, has an insulating effect. These particles or aerosols are then able to create this albedo effect and, and kind of cause some of the sunlight to bounce off. The downside of um, doing global cooling by volcanoes, of course, is that it makes a big mess and it often destroys things. And then on top of that, you have uh, acid rain. You know, sulfur dioxide combines with water in the atmosphere to form sulfuric acid, and that's, of course, harmful. Um, and basically when this happens, when the, this release happens in the troposphere, you have this deep convection effect. And so basically um, anything that, that winds up in the troposphere ends up kind of like going up and down a lot of times. And that's really actually responsible for, you know, common weather patterns that we have, like cold fronts and things like that. And just basically there's, there's just a lot of convection happening in the lower la layers of the atmosphere. In the stratosphere, things are a little bit less convective in nature, and they're and they're kind of more steady. So if you can get materials up into the stratosphere, they tend to stick around for a longer period of time. What's interesting is this NASA article says that a study published in July 21st, 2011, presents new evidence that particles located in the upper layer of the atmosphere, also called the stratosphere, have played a significant role in cooling the climate in the past decade, despite being at persistently low levels. Stratospheric aerosols are a small variable in the climate change equation, said Larry Thomason, a scientist at NASA's Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia, and co-author on the paper. But if you compare the climate system to a balanced scale, it doesn't take much to tip that scale. Stratospheric aerosols have that potential. So in other words, the materials that are already in the stratosphere are playing an impact in this heating cooling balance, and they're part of what's making, for instance, global warming from happening too quickly. Which is to say it would be happening even faster if we didn't have this effect in the atmosphere. So that being said, the stratospheric aerosol injection strategy would basically take advantage of this natural effect of volcanoes, skip the large explosion and the release of ash and sulfur dioxide in the troposphere, and just directly release sulfur-containing compounds or other particles in this upper atmosphere, in the stratosphere region, in the hopes of enhancing this effect. So this was actually depicted, or something like it was depicted, in the movie Snowpiercer in the opening scene. And um, th since it happened in the beginning, this will not spoil the movie for you, but 
Uh, obviously, it doesn't go well. It's a dystopian movie. Um, and so so the government or companies, whoever it is, decide to release this this compound in the Yatmer atmosphere to basically cause this effect, but they overdo it, they overcorrect, and it plunges the Earth instantly into a horrific ice age that's so bad that almost no life can survive. Um, and so, of course, that's the setup for the movie, which is a pretty interesting movie. I recommend it, uh, but it's intense. But the point is, is that I, I do think that some of the things that these NASA scientists are saying actually suggest that it, it might be possible to actually overcorrect, especially in this sentence here. This, um, if you compare the climate system to a balanced scale, it doesn't take much to tip that scale. That's pretty ominous. In fact, we do have an example in history of where the balance shifted too far. So it was, uh, I, I was able to find this article here from Wikipedia. It's a year without a summer. The year 1816 is known as the year without a summer because of severe climate abnormalities that caused average global temperatures to decrease by 0.4 to 0.7 degrees C. Summer temperatures in Europe were the coldest on record between the period from 1766 and 2000. This resulted in major food shortages across the Northern Hemisphere. And what they think is basically this was a volcanic winter event that was caused by the massive 1815 eruption of Mount Tambori in the Dutch East Indies, known today as Indonesia. This eruption was the largest in at least 1300 years. And basically it would be due to this effect here, this large uh, volcanic cloud of ash and sulfur dioxide has basically a, a couple of different mechanisms for, uh, for, for global cooling. One is just the ash cloud itself, and then there's this stratospheric aerosol layer, which presumably it really enhanced. It was, according to Wikipedia, a, a huge agricultural disaster. Historian John D. Post has called this the, the last great subsistence crisis in the Western world. And in China, there was a massive famine. Floods destroyed many remaining crops. And basically, there was a lot of death and devastation. So the idea that we could maybe overcorrect is something to really pay attention to. And that gets us to the original article we were talking about. So it says, it's a tempting thought with climate change so difficult to manage, and nations unwilling to take decisive action, what if we could mitigate its effects by setting up a kind of chemical umbrella, a layer of sulfuric acid in the upper atmosphere that would reflect the sun's radiation and cool the earth? What could possibly go wrong, right? What this article is basically pointing out is that although we do have a pretty good understanding, for instance, of how sulfur dioxide releases into the troposphere um, play out in terms of atmospheric chemistry, things are not as clear as what would happen if we directly released them into the stratosphere. So normally, of course, the uh, with volcanoes, for instance, the sulfur dioxide releases happen in the lower atmosphere, and then they and then the materials that are formed there, chemically speaking, in the atmosphere in the lower atmosphere, make their way up into the up, upper atmosphere. What we're talking about is directly releasing things into the stratosphere, which is a little bit different. And in this study, they basically break down how some of our assumptions as to how this work might not play out in this scenario. They say conditions change as the altitude increases. Notably, the air becomes drier and the energy of the sun's rays becomes stronger. And in this new work, they explore how these variables affect the chemical reactions involved in making sulfuric acid. So the major inputs, as we said before, with volcanoes are sulfur dioxide, which reacts with hydroxyl radicals, OH, a kind of atmospheric detergent to create HOSO2. This HOSO2 then reacts with oxygen to create sulfur trioxide, SO3, which then reacts with water vapor to create sulfuric acid. So it's like a multi-step reaction to form uh, this sulfuric acid, which then is able to form this aerosol, which reflects the sunlight. And it says these reactions are well characterized. Together, they are responsible for creating acid rain in the troposphere. But whether that chemistry would work in the stratosphere and achieve the same efficiency is unknown. So it's interesting, according to their calculations, things would actually turn out pretty differently than this. Specifically, the researchers found that when HOSO2, which is one of the intermediates that we discussed, uh, is produced in the stratosphere, solar radiation causes the molecule to quickly photolyze, essentially breaking apart into its component parts, including sulfur dioxide, which is harmful to humans in high concentrations. So basically, if you put sulfur dioxide up there, it's going to just be recycling around. So it opens the door to whether we have a full understanding of atmospheric sulfur chemistry up in the stratosphere. In contrast, the researchers found that SO3 levels remain quite stable in the stratospheric conditions. So of those different chemicals, we're talking about starting with SO2, and then going to HOSO2 and SO3, and then going to 
uh, sulfuric acid. Instead, what we're doing is we're basically uh, recycling back to sulfur dioxide, and then those compounds that make it to HOSO2 will go ahead and create sulfur trioxide. So you have SO2 and SO3, but there's not enough water vapor to go all the way to sulfuric acid. So basically the entire reaction sequence is gonna be thrown off and you're gonna have higher concentrations of SO2 and SO3, and you're gonna not really see too much of the other chemical species. They say this work points to a cautionary note. If the SO3 chemistry is different, then how does it interact with other chemistry that's currently going on in the stratosphere? We need to consider whether there are any other kinds of chemical concerns that we need to think about up front. The findings also highlight the need for a plan B if the atmospheric chemistry doesn't play out as expected. It raises a fundamentally important question, Francisco says. If we put the sulfur dioxide in, can we get it out of the stratosphere? And this is the most interesting part. And while some scientists are already proposing to trial a geoengineering approach using SO2, Francisco and his colleagues underscore that the outcomes depend on some aspects of sulfur chemistry that remain unknown. And that is probably the most important sentence in this entire video, which is that the outcomes depend on some aspects of sulfur chemistry that remain unknown. And that basically means that if we try this geoengineering approach, it is a huge gamble. We don't know what will happen. So for instance, they're saying this SO2 and SO3, it, it's not gonna go all the way to sulfuric acid mostly, it's just gonna hang out in the upper atmosphere. And we don't know what it's gonna do. It could end up doing some other unforeseen chemistry. Maybe there's something that it will do to the ozone layer, who knows? The point is, is that uh, is, is that we don't know, and so it's probably not smart to just go ahead and give it a try, unless they try it at a very, very limited level. And this actually relates to something else that I think is incredibly important and not talked about enough, especially when it comes to the climate, is the concept of the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle basically, according to Wikipedia, emphasizes caution, pausing, and review before leaping into new innovations that may prove disastrous. And so the idea is, especially when you don't really know what the effects are going to be, or you're dealing with systems which are, uh, which have many secondary effects, you know, you know. So for instance, um, the precautionary principle advocates a lot of caution when you're dealing with things that have a chance of kind of ballooning out of control, even if it's a small chance. If you don't know all of the secondary effects of something, you should just be very, very cautious about it. And that's actually the reason why I'm so concerned about global climate change. I actually personally do not put a whole lot of weight into the modeling and simulation that predicts a certain amount of global warming or says exactly how the climate disaster is gonna play out. I just think that from a precautionary standpoint, it is very, very unwise for a given species, the human race, to actually change the chemical composition of the atmosphere. And what we've been doing over the last uh, you know, 100 years or so, especially accelerating in, in, in the later stages of the Industrial Revolution, is we've been releasing so much carbon dioxide through our industrial activities that we've actually changed the chemical composition of the atmosphere in a noticeable and measurable way. And my point is, yes, I understand the concept of greenhouse gas effect, I understand the idea of global warming, it might not play out that way. It might be okay, or it might be even worse than even the most pessimistic uh, projections re regarding the climate. And, and that's because it's a very, very complex system. The climate is, there's so many variables and it's not possible to really accurately predict what will happen out over decades and centuries. And so it's just very unwise. So what's interesting about this approach, stratospheric aerosol injection, is that although we think it might basically reverse the effect of greenhouse gas emissions by, by putting another compound in, we don't actually know how it will play out. And I really appreciate this article because it did some basic you know, quantum chemistry and said, okay, so right off the bat, there's some problems with our assumptions. They're not saying we know exactly how it will play out, but we do know that the very simplistic prediction based on how sulfur dioxide interacts with the troposphere probably will not play out the same way in the stratosphere. So the idea is that we would fix some problems which are caused by us artificially tampering with the chemical composition of the atmosphere by 
artificially tampering with the chemical composition of the atmosphere, to me, is just a non-starter. So I really hope they don't do this. I think that the way to um, combat climate change is going to be uh, more along the lines of mitigating emissions or perhaps uh, doing some carbon capture or methane capture strategies. I'm, I'm, I think that that is less likely to balloon out of control than just releasing uh, you know, chemicals into the upper atmosphere and hoping for the best. Well, I'm really curious to know your take on this. Is this a good idea? Is this a terrible idea? Let me know what you think. And I would appreciate it if you would like the video and subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. And I want to thank you so much for watching. I hope you'll join me again in the future soon. Bye.